Thanks Praise for God. Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, we'll get started this evening, tonight. Uh, just a quick announcement. Um, we will be having a Christmas Eve candlelight service. So uh, we're very, very excited about that. Something we do each year. In fact, last year, Christmas Eve candlelight service was our first service in this building. So that was super exciting. And the place was Pretty, pretty full, and so uh, we want to fill it up again and overflowing. How's that? Amen? Are you in agreement with that? So we're going to be uh, creating some little cards to hand out to your friends and neighbors and, and family to invite them to come out and be a part of our service. And uh, as you can see, we've started some renovations on the uh, stage here and platform. There'll be more to come, and uh, so we're very excited about these projects that are before us. Um, to, to get this uh, looking a little different, a little the way we, way we want it, more like home for us, praise God. So, and just so you know, in case you don't know, home, home for me is like, it needs to be bright. Like I like bright churches and lights and bright, okay? So I don't like dark. You like dark, that's cool. You, you, you can do that all you want. But for me, as, as a pastor, it's like I, I want a nice bright light setting and uh, service. And so that's what we're working to create here in the atmosphere of this. And so what it looks like not only here, but also online, praise God. Well, let's get into the Word of God tonight. Very excited again to be back with you and ministering um, again on Thursdays. You know, we had Thanksgiving last week and Minister Mike ministered the week prior to that. And uh, it's just been such a blessing uh, to hear Mike minister and flourish um, as a minister of the gospel. He just blesses me every time I hear him speak. I'm just so grateful for him. But let's get into tonight's message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your word. We've come now to hear and to receive of you. Lord, I just thank you that you will help me to minister your word with accuracy, with boldness, Lord, and that we are here as hearers of the word and doers of the word. We're hearing it, we receive it by faith, we grab a hold of it, and we will apply what we hear and learn from you to our lives in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God, praise God. Well, if you have a Bible, go with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, please. In case you forgot what we're ministering on on Thursdays, I've been teaching a series entitled Humility, Meekness, and Love. Say that with me. Humility, meekness, and love. Praise God. Hallelujah. Great enthusiasm just shreds across the crowd as we release this title. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I've heard other ministers uh, minister on topics similar to this, such as humility and, and or pride. And, um, you know, these are people that are ministers of the gospel that have large ministries, you know, much, much, much larger than our ministry, of course. And would you agree that pride is pretty pervasive in our society? <laughs> I mean, the more you know about humility and meekness and the God kind of love, the more you can recognize pride, really. The more you identify with who God is, the more you can identify with how the world looks and acts, really. And it's interesting is that I've heard other ministers talk about that they put together series such as similar to this on like humility or pride and things like that. And it's one of the least downloaded or purchased, however they do it, titles that they have in their in their you know in the repertoire of of all of what they minister on, it isn't interesting, as if the church has it all put together and we don't need to know about humility or here here sign me up teach me I want to learn more about humility but really our attitude should be would you agree that we should want to know and learn more about how to live and how to walk in humility, humbly, as Christ, with meekness and love and the love of God. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Praise God. So it's interesting. We, we, it just the nature of, of people oftentimes isn't to gravitate towards a sermon like this, you know? That's because, I mean, that's just 
what the flesh doesn't want and just like, yeah, t t teach me how to be more humble, please. <laughs> right? You know, the, the flesh isn't, doesn't respond like that necessarily. But our spirit man, our spirit man is very hungry for these things because our spirit man uh, in here, it, it identifies with God. We're, we are born again, born of his spirit. And so this is something that our spirit man, as we feed our spirit man this, our spirit man feeds on this and thrives on this and flourishes on messages like this. Praise God. It's like kind of the example I gave Sunday. It's like you might look at the plate of healthy food and you immediately go, ah, can I just have something fattening and this, that, and the other, and, you know, like kind of just feel good food. You know, there's like feel good food, right? But then you eat it, it's set before you, you eat it, and afterwards you feel good. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever eaten something that you know it's not good for you, and after you ate it, you went, oh man, why did I eat that? Ever say that? Why did I eat that? Right? Well, it really is true with spiritual things. You can put a message on and sit and listen to a message like this. And at first, you might not get all super excited about hearing about humility and meekness and the love of God. But then after you, after you partake of it, you go, you know what? Praise God, I needed that. Man, I needed that for, for, for my life. Boy, I needed that in my life. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So here in Romans 12, too, we read this previously. We'll read it again. We're going to go back through some of these things. It says, do not copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Praise God. Then you will learn to know. Say that with me. You will learn to know. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago. You'll learn to know it, right? You'll learn to know God's will for you. Man, don't you want to know God's will for your life? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Woo. Which is good and pleasing and perfect. God's will for your life is good, pleasing, and perfect. Amen? Now, I, again, being humble, walking in humility, living meek, operating and functioning in the love of God, the God kind of love, it is not the most popular way to be. It is not very acceptable by the world's standards and culture. It is, it is, it is barely acceptable in the church, meaning even amongst church people. It's incredibly short supply, an incredible short supply. Um, you know, I was thinking about the show. We happened to watch that little section of the show that you were talking about with Kelly Clarkson and that dentist. You could just see the humility on that guy. Uh, you know, he came back to this little, his hometown, I think, of Staples. And, you know, it was interesting. He's talking about as a kid, he had a toothache, and the toothache hurt him so bad, and there was no dentist in his town that it just marked him, and he was in such terrible pain from this toothache that it just inspired him that he was a little guy that once he grew up, he was going to be a dentist because he wouldn't want a toothache, you know? And uh, then has, he's come back to his hometown, and he, and he offers services. I, I think it's, he even offers free services to the people of that hometown, if I remember correctly. It was like, what a blessing. What, what a blessing to see that humility and him walking in that and, and doing that for his community. And it's like you can just see the humility on people. You know, and like I said, humility is like something that it's like we talked about how you, it's, you're, you can be clothed in it. Remember a few weeks ago? And I said, you can see a humble person when they walk in the room. They don't even have to open their mouth sometimes. And conversely, you can see a prideful person oftentimes when they walk in the room. Right? And if you look, I don't think we'll have time to do it tonight, but you look in the book of Isaiah, it talks about um, how 
how people, how pride just began to take over people and how they would, the clothes they'd wear and the jewelry they'd wear and the piercings and the, 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 the way they would walk, they would, they would do all this stuff just to, I mean, everything was about the show. Everything was about the outward person. It's like you can look at a book in the Bible from all the way back from the book of Isaiah, and it's almost like you took it out of today's magazines, uh, f- fashion magazines, and you say, yep, uh, yep, uh, yep, and you could see the pride because there was so much focus on the outward person, the outward facade, if you will, who it was. And we read here in Romans where Paul says, don't copy the world. Amen? Don't copy their behavior, their customs. Let God transform you by doing what? Changing the way you think. Praise God, we're a church that is changing the way we think. And we're letting God change the way we think. We're letting His Word change the way we think. Amen? We're allowing the Holy Spirit, the inward witness in here, change the way we think. Amen? Amen? You ever, you know, somebody ever do you wrong and does something mean to you and this, that, and the other? I mean, when, when I was in competitive sports and things like that, and, and in, well, when I was in high school, <laughs> I mean, here's just, here's just a picture of it, okay? I look at I'm very, very grateful for the, the high school that my kids go to. It happens to be a Christian high school, and uh, very blessed that our kids are, have the privilege of going there. And I see, I'm just so blessed by the coaches because how they talk to them, they do a devotion with them each time after every practice. And I hear over and over again, humility, being humble, understanding where sports should be in a person's life and the priority that we should have in life, teaching these young people these things. And now I I think back to when I was in high school, I went to a Christian high school, as did my wife. (laughs) Now, again, I'm just saying, (laughs) just because it has Christian high school on the name, okay, (laughs) you know. Our coach would make when we played basketball, and we were a very good basketball team, we would we'd travel all over Florida and even the southern United States in high school and, and just whip up on teams. And we were a tiny little Christian high school, but we were just had a really strong program. But our coach, <laughs> who was, again, I'm just talking about, so I'm not going to say any names, who was the pastor of the church, okay? Now, we didn't attend the church, but our coach would on purpose wait until the other team was out on the floor warming up, okay? And then we were instructed as high school players that we were supposed to go out and stare, stare at the other players and make a complete lap around them and say, you, 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 to try to intimidate them. That's, that, now I look at, back at it and I'm like, how is that possible that at Christian high school, this is what we were doing, but that's what we were taught to do? Well, then that, I'm telling you, that begins to affect you. It affected all of us as players. And, and we, we, we developed greatly in pride. We would win, we'd beat a lot of teams, and we'd walk around town, and everybody knew what team we played on, and we were proud of that. That's I look, that, I look back at that, that stinks. That was not right. And, you know, you get carried on to college, and man, if somebody, you know, did you wrong and, and did a dirty move on you or elbowed you or, you know, something like that, oh, man, you're, you're ready to, you know, you're, you're ready to do everything you need to do to win that game, man. You're just going to just all out. You're just not going to lose that game. But you know, what happens is that that's all pride, that all, it, it gets ingrained in you, you begin to think that way rather than thinking God's way on things. And, 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 and you could walk in a basketball gym and you could, have, you could have smelt the pride on us walking in. That's how prideful we were. Now, at the time, I didn't, I didn't really realize it. I, I thought, well, this is what it takes to win. 
because it was a really, you know, winning organization. But that's not what it takes to win. That's definitely not what it takes to win in life. Yeah. Amen? And so you can see, what were we doing? Even though we were, the title on our school was Christian school, we weren't acting like Christians. We weren't acting Christ-like. We were acting very worldly-like. And that's why Christian leadership is so important in our lives, isn't it? So that we recognize these things, identify these things, because every one of us have to deal with this in our life. And if somebody does you wrong, man, where is the humility? Where is the meekness? Where is the love of God? Amen? Amen? Don't think that the church doesn't need to hear this. The church needs to hear this. I'm going to say that one more time. When somebody does you wrong, somebody does something to you that, that hurts you, says something to you, does something to you physically, whatever it may be, where is the humility? Where is the meekness? Where is the love of God? I mean, I'm not perfect in this, okay? I'm not standing up here preaching this because I'm perfect in it. I, I've got to work on this. I came down. We, we played football Thanksgiving morning. And I had to repent to Jeff for being a, for being a jerk. <laughs> I said, um, <clears throat> I may have been a little bit of, I didn't say a little bit. I said, I got to repent for being a jerk to you like that. Be a, I said, a competitive jerk to you like that. He's like, no, it's not. I didn't even know. You know, we get together and have a good time and have fun. But, you know, it's like, I, I don't want that. I said, I don't, want, I don't want that. I don't want, even if he didn't take it as that, you know, we were competitive playing against each other. I don't want that. I don't want that in me. And, and I, I still got to work on that. Okay. But you got to identify it. And the best way I know how to deal with it is just to get out front and just apologize, repent for it, and say it out loud so you can not be like that. Amen? Amen? Praise God. All right. So let's keep going here. Go with me now over to, uh, go to Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Let's go look here. It says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Doing what? Preferring one another. You remember we read this in a few different uh, translations and versions. It says, love each other in the new living with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in honoring each other. The Passion Translation says, be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family. Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor to one another. Is this important? Is this important in our church? Is this important in our relationships? Is this important in our marriages? Absolutely. Everywhere you go, this is important. And you remember the message translation? Remember, we, remember that little, little part that we read there? It says, practice playing second fiddle. Remember that? Practice playing second fiddle. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, we have, we have to constantly check ourselves where this is concerned. And, and we have to confer with the Holy Spirit, right? Who, who's living in us. And make sure that we're not copying the world's behavior. This is something we just got to do. And we need to be willing to submit our life and submit our will to the will of the Lord. Amen? To God's will. His will is what? Good, pleasing, and perfect. Say it with me. Good, pleasing, and perfect. That's the will of God. His will for our life is good. It's perfect. Praise God. Our, I know our culture is not big on humility, and we can't help the way other people treat us, but we certainly can help how we respond to other people. Amen? Amen. Go to Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Quick, I'm just quickly still reviewing. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. There that was again, learn of me. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Oh, doesn't that sound like good news? Rest unto your souls. He says in New Living, he says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Praise God. And we looked at the message where it talks about, I'll show you how to take a real rest, walk with me, work with me, 
Watch how I do it. He said, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Remember we talked about that? The unforced rhythms of grace. And I absolutely believe it's true that there is a rhythm to God's grace. I know that might sound silly and kind of odd to you, but I really believe there is a rhythm to God's grace. God's grace has such a calming effect on people's lives, and most importantly, on your life. A calming effect on your life. Amen? And it's like, I, I, I don't know how to describe it other than it's like the more you choose to operate in God's grace and His love and humility, it's like the better you flow in it. It's like you make a decision, you know what, I'm just going to humble myself in this situation. And it's like, it's like you just get better at doing it. You, you, you make the decision, I'm going to humble myself in here, and then it just becomes easier. At first, it's not so easy. You know, at first you're like, right? Because you're not really used to it. You know, you, you kind of, you know, it's like, I, I'll just use that example of basketball. I begin to finally grow up. I remember one day I was just so opinionated about everybody that was on the basketball court. And I was like in my late teens. I, I was like, I don't know, 19, 20. I think I was in college around that time playing basketball. And I went to this basketball court. And I remember just playing. I was just out there. None of my buddies were there. And I remember I got this rebound. I remember exactly where I was at. And it was like, I saw, I, I, I like heard myself. You ever do this? I know it was the Holy Spirit helping me. I like heard my own self and my own, the, the, the way I was thinking. You can like, you know what I'm talking about? You can like hear yourself the way you think and the pattern of the way you're thinking towards other people. And it was just the Lord saying, who do you think you are? It was like the only reason you can do anything of what you do is my ability that I've given you to do it. And at that moment, I, I, I made a decision that I'm going to change. I'm going to change as an athlete. I'm going to change as a young man. And it didn't come all, all at once. You know, the next time came around, and this, I remember this kid was just running his mouth and talking trash, and because that's kind of that environment, you know, and stuff like that. And I mean, I wanted to double barrel right back at him, you know. And I just began to like, you know, so to speak, bite my tongue and not say anything and just smile and just play hard and just be, just be cool. Just be cool, you know? Now, I had to learn that. I hadn't been taught that. And I didn't even have anybody teaching me that on the court. I didn't have a coach teaching me that or anything. But the Holy Spirit was my teacher. And he began to teach me and show me these things and, and to walk in a greater level. Now, I had no idea. All the while, the Lord's preparing me for ministry. But hey, you don't have to be called to, to fivefold ministry to, to need this improvement in your life. Amen? This is something we all need to walk in. I mean, I, you could just bring it right into the, your own car driving down the road somebody does something stupid you want to say how can we be so stupid stupid right i mean i i've grown up driving you know riding driving motorcycles and when i see you know motorcycles and crotch rockets fly by me and do stupid things on them i used to always talk about them you know what I used to say? That's exactly why they get killed. Because they drive stupid. Well, what is that? That's pride that I would never drive like that. <laughs> and the only reason anybody ever dies on a motorcycle is because they're stupid. And I'm so smart and alive. It's really, honestly, I'm, I'm being, that's really what that comes out of. Are you with me? And you know what? I changed it. The Lord began to just deal with me on it. And anytime I see somebody, I mean, this week, somebody, wow, and went flying up. I'm like thinking, you have no business going that fast on this road. Anybody can pull out. There's no way. I know how fast those things can go. I've been on them. I've been, I've driven that fast. And I went, that is, and I began, I stopped it. I said, Lord, I just thank you for your angels around about him. And Lord, I just pray for the wisdom of God on that young man, that he drives that motorcycle with wisdom and discretion in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, this is, this, but this, th those little changes and corrections in our life. See, what is that? That's, 
Now, that's not pride towards that person. Now, that's God's love towards that person, right? And I'm just saying, these are the little corrections that all of us can make in our life. Day in, day out. You turn the TV on. You look at the internet. Boy, you can find some dumb things out there, right? But it doesn't do you or heaven any good if all the Christians just talk about all the dumb people and all the dumb things they're doing. And I'm, I'm still guilty of it, I, I'm telling you, but I'm working on it. Every, I'm working on it every week. This is something I'm working on. I'm striving to make a change in this area. And I'm telling you, unfortunately, not enough Christians inspire to be more humble. They don't even inspire to be more humble. They're fine with who they are, the way they talk, the way they act, the way they think about other people, and that's just the way they're going to be because they're happy with it. But guess what? That's not, shouldn't be our attitude. We should just inspire to be yet more humble next week than we were this week. To walk in meekness in a greater measure next week than we did this week. And to function in the love of God. You know, the Bible says that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Amen? Love our neighbor. That's the greatest commandment, Jesus said in the New Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Praise God. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm here to encourage every one of us, including myself, to walk in a greater measure of humility and love and unity in our life. Praise God. And by the way, humility is not weakness. It is not. In fact, humility requires great strength. The, humility requires being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Go with me to Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah 6, 8. Look, look how this reads here. I really like this. Micah 6, 8. And I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. It says, no o, no, o people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what He requires of you. To do what is right. To love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Boy, didn't that sum it up? Do what is right, love mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord. Let's say that together. Do what is right, love mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord. Amen? This should be an example of our life, that we're doing what is right, that we, that we love mercy. Say, I love mercy. Now, we love mercy being bestowed upon us. Well, that's easy. Everybody loves that. But we need to love to be merciful towards other people. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Go with me to Daniel chapter 4. Go to Daniel chapter 4. Let's look at this. This is a, uh, this is a pretty, pretty good example this is talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. You remember him? And you remember the dream he had? And uh, just a quick overview of who King Nebuchadnezzar was. King Nebuchadnezzar at the time was one of the most powerful men on the planet. He, uh, he was over the Babylonian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire at that time had conquered the known world, so he was really like, he wasn't just state champion. He wasn't just national champion. He was like world champion, right? But in the game of real life where they, he was, that's the, the position he was in, the most powerful guy on the planet, really. And he had become, as a result, full of pride. Full of pride. And he had a dream and you probably know about the dream, and I won't go into all that tonight, but his, his wise men that he had on council were not able to interpret the dream, and of course Daniel did interpret the dream, and there was an angel that had, uh, was going to come down and take Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom for seven years. You remember that? 
And for seven years, it was said in this dream, it, that was interpreted in this dream, that King Nebuchadnezzar would, um, he was going to eat grass like an animal. Remember that? He was going to lose his mind. He was going to act like an animal. His uh, body would be covered with like fur, like hair. His fingernails were going to grow and turn into like claws. I mean, this is some, this is some crazy stuff, man. And uh, that he would walk, he, that he would live, I mean, with no clothes and no shelter, just like a wild beast of the field. Now think about this, the most powerful man on the planet, adorned with everything. I mean, at one point, he had a statue made, 60-foot statue of gold, <laughs> okay? That's, that's some wealth, okay? You think that different people have wealth now, that's some wealth. 60-foot statue of gold, right? Conqueror of, 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 of all the known world that was at the time. And you see, like, he's here in one minute. He, now he becomes full of pride and all this stuff. And you'll begin to see what happens. Let's, let's look at this. So Daniel, let's begin reading in Daniel chapter 4. I didn't tell you where to go, apologize. And verse 27. I'll read again also in the New Living. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Now, could he have stopped sinning and done what is right? Absolutely. <laughs> he says, break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on a flat of his royal palace in Babylon. As he looked across the city, he said, look what he says, look at this great city of Babylon by my own might, excuse me, by my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat uh, grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way, until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. That same hour, the judgment was fulfilled, and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of the heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. Wow. Wow. From the palace to the pasture. Look at verse 34. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, my sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting. His kingdom is eternal. Oh, thank God for God's mercy. It says all the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? <laughs> when my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored as head of my kingdom, even, uh, excuse me, with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. Woohoo! So, Nebuchadnezzar went from being the most powerful human being on the earth to living like an animal. He had a statue of over 60 feet of gold made for people to worship at his command. He goes from that to being a person who was crazy 
and out of his mind. Pride is destructive. Say it with me. Pride is destructive. And don't sit here and think, well, I'm not as prideful as Nebuchadnezzar, so I'm fine. No, literally, all pride is destructive. Amen? Amen. All pride is destructive. Pride will blind your mind and make you stupid. I'll just say it plain. It'll blind your mind and make you stupid. Pride will cause people to do the dumbest things you've ever seen, ever. Pride will cause a person to lose proper judgment. It distorts a person's judgment. In Daniel 5.20, it says, in the next chapter, it says, when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. Pride will cause a person's life to absolutely go off the rails. You know what I mean? I mean, they could be like, they could have a pretty normal life and be functioning as a pretty normal human being. And, you know, pride will cause them. Next thing you know, you're like, what in the world? You're, you know, I, I've talked to many people like this that were living sort of, so to speak, on top of the world, right? Had, had nice cars, nice home. Everything seemed to be going good and just got full of themselves got involved with the wrong people, start doing drugs, cocaine. I mean, I'm thinking of someone right now that grew up in a very prominent family, very wealthy individual, um, a handsome guy. Phys uh, uh, his physical physique was, he was a very, really strong, muscular guy. And I heard where he ended up and living like he was living that I, it, it's so egregious I won't even tell you what I found out about this guy from this pulpit. It's that bad. I mean, just how far pride can take a person, okay, to the fact that he lost everything, teeth falling out of his head, terribly overweight, no relationship, pedophile, bad. Went from one place to another place, and I'm telling you, pride is certainly involved. And this is exactly what the enemy tries to do to people's lives. This is a telltale sign of the enemy at work. And pride is of the enemy, and pride is very destructive for our life. Even if it's a little destructive because you engage in a little bit of it, it's still destructive. And if you don't make change, pride will take you down a road that you never intended on going. Pride affects the way a person thinks. Pride affects the way a person makes decisions. And pride causes you to ask the question, how dumb can someone be and still be breathing? <laughs> you ever met somebody that you knew that was like a normal person? And then you talk to them a few years later and you're like, are you kidding me? Can you not see the path you're on? Can you not see the destruction that you're involving yourself in? You're, 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 you're self-destructing by your own pride. You ever know anybody like that? Yeah? I mean, all of us, in, in some measure, have allowed this to happen in our life, probably, right? There's, there's no one here that's exempt from this at all. Every one of us, including myself, has, has given into this in some degree or another, right? But I'm telling you, you, and this is how, you know, this is what, you may be listening to this, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're in the room, I don't know, maybe you're, you're, you're an alcoholic, maybe you're, you're, you smoke pot, and maybe, you, you know, you're living in sin, and, and, you're, and you're doing these things that are hurting you. You're doing these things that you knowingly are hurting you but because you get a little satisfaction out of it. It makes you feel good temporarily or, you know, you, whatever it may be. It makes you, it, it, you like the way it makes you feel. Let me say it like that. You like the way it makes you feel. But you know, you know that you know it's a temporary satisfaction. You know it. But because you care more about you 
and the way you feel, you continue to do it. You can make a change. I said you can make a change. You know it's wrong, and you can make a change. God is merciful, gracious, humble, and loving. And you can get back on track. You can clean that mess up by allowing the Holy Spirit to help you. And you humble yourself before God and His Word, and you say, you know what? I'm done pleasing me. I'm going to seek the will of God for my life. And I'm going to seek His will, because when I follow God's will, it is good, it is pleasing, and it is perfect. Say it with me. It is good, it is pleasing, and it is perfect. Hallelujah. This is something that every one of us need to dust the cobwebs out of our own life. You know what I mean? The pride cobwebs. And we need to say, you know what, Lord? Show me. Reveal to me. I want to get this out of my life. I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. Amen? And you know, I've, uh, we, we, if we get to it, maybe next week we'll talk about it, but I've seen people, you've seen people, they, the, 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 the pride creeps in, and they've got to have that next new model car, the next outfit, and there's nothing wrong with the next new model car. Nothing wrong with the next new model car, as long as that next new model car doesn't have you. As long as not the purpose of having that is to be prideful towards someone else. Or they have to have the outfit, or they have to have the hairdo, or they have to have the shoes, and they have to have this. Because I have seen people that have had a lot of those things and still operate in great humility. Great humility. I'm thinking of a couple of people right now, some of the wealthiest people in our area. Extremely wealthy people and still maintain a walk of humility. And it is so refreshing to talk to them because it's like, I, I have a, a, an idea of what their worth, their net worth is, and yet I can talk to somebody else that comes in there and their net worth isn't even a tenth of what these other people's is and the pride coming out of them. So don't think just because somebody has a lot of money automatically they're prideful. Money doesn't dictate the pride. It's what position you give it in your life. Amen? And that goes with anything else. This goes all the way across the board. I mean, some people are extremely prideful in their education. Some people are extremely prideful in their ability to debate. Oh, they're going to debate you down. They'll talk you down. They know how to talk you down. Well, we've been talking about that on Sundays. Apostle Paul says, listen, I didn't come with you with eloquent speech and this, that, and the other. I came to you relying on one thing, the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? The power of God. And so we, we just have to go back and just remind ourselves, you know what? Everything I have is because of God's goodness. Everything I have is because of His mercy. Everything I have is because of His great love for me. Praise God. God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. And, and I, I found, this is just a little thing that I found to do. You can, you can do what you want with this. You, this might be too much for you. I don't know. But something that I've tried to do, endeavor to do, is especially when I really, really want something. You ever really want something? You see, you're like, oh, I really want it. You can't seem to get it out of your mind. You just kind of wake up thinking, well, I really want it, you know? First of all, I've learned to hit pause on that. I've learned to do that and say, you know what, Lord? I don't want to have that if it's going to take the wrong place in my life. If that's, going to have, if that's going to take the wrong place in my life, I'd rather not even have it. As bad as I want it, I'd rather not even have it. And I can wait another day. I can wait another week. I can wait another year, whatever it takes, you know, to have it. I don't have to have that. I'd really like it, but I don't have to have it. It's one thing. The second thing is, is it, once you get something like that that you really like, I found this is a little thing I do is I go before the Lord and I say, Lord, thank you for this. I really like this. This is really cool. I give him praise for it. And I say, Lord, if you would like me to give it away, I'll give it away tomorrow. I'll give it away tomorrow. And you know I really like it, but I'll give it away tomorrow. I'll do it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll do it tomorrow. 
You say, you tell me who to give it to, I'll give it to them. Yep. And you've got to be honest about that. And there's some things that I've bought and I've turned around and gave away. And you're like, <laughs> but you know what? Every time, every time I've done that, God restores. We were out to dinner last week and Lord, I had some money in my pocket and we met a young gentleman goes to this church out and Lord told me, put, put the money that's in your pocket in his hand when you shake his hand. I was like, oh man, it's just a little walking around money, you know? Why is he messing with my walking around money? You know, I got, see, I got some right here right now. And I, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would shake his hand and I put that money. He's like, what? And he's like, no, no, no. I'm like, yeah, no, Lord just told me to do that. This is something I, I do on a regular basis. And uh, somebody had given me a card. And it was for pastor appreciation or something. Yeah, that's what it was for. And I didn't know that I'd received that card. And I have a little area where my wife puts my mail. And I, you know, forget about it a lot. And then I grab that stack of mail and I put it and I take it in my office. And so uh, that was this weekend. Monday, I'm, I'm at the office. I'm going through my mail. And I'm like, there's a card here. I open it up. And it, I'd had it for weeks, this card. I opened it up. A beautiful card. Just such a blessing. The words that were written in there. And more money than I gave to that person. I was like, God, 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 it was in the cabinet all along and you knew it and I didn't even know it. It just seems like, it, it, sounds, it sounds silly, but it's just like a little thing. You think, oh, there's a little bit of cash leaving and you just had this little bit of cash, you know, and then God's going, I got the cash that's in your cupboard. You don't even know it's there. He has so many things for us that we don't even know are there. And I just believe that as we, in obedience and humility, respond to his voice, respond to him, it's like he's already lined these things up to come into our life. And as we respond, it's, it's like, I don't know how to say it other than it's like, when we respond, it's like we turn. And then we go, oh, it's right there. But we, you don't see it until you respond. And when you respond in faith to his word, it's like, it's like the light just opens up and shows you the whole room. And you begin to see more and more of what the plan that he has for you. And that's that good, and that pleasing, and that perfect will that he has for your life. And it's, it's, to me, it's the only way to live, you know. It, but you still got to do this. You got to just a little at a time, deal with that pride, deal with it, get it out, expose it. Check yourself, correct yourself, allow the Holy Spirit to reveal in you. Amen? Amen? I mean, it won't hurt my feelings at all if this church, West Coast Word Church, is known as the most humble, loving, meek church in all the world. Amen. It won't hurt my feelings. In fact, it would make me happy. And what's come up a couple weeks ago was about the, the spirit of unity that God is, 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 is doing in our land and around the world and that this church was going to be a participant in that spirit of unity, the, the God kind of unity, okay? And I'm not just saying, oh, we're just going to put up with the world and what they do. It's okay. Now, I'm not talking about that. This is a little different. We'll get to it as the Lord's going to reveal to me. But I mean, this, this, I'm talking about this, this love walk, this humility, this meekness. I'm telling you, this is not weakness. This is not weakness. You have to really be strong in the Lord to walk in this level of humility. But you can do it. Amen? Because the greater one lives in you. Did you get something out of this? Stand to your feet. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for revealing in us all these little areas that we need changing and tweaking and correcting, Lord. It's just, it's just a good thing for our life and that we submit ourselves and change the way we think to your will, God's will for us. Thank you for providing us and preparing for us the good life. The good life. We 
humble ourselves before you, Lord, now. Just let the Lord take just, just a few minutes and just listen to the Lord in your own heart right now. Everyone across the room, everyone watching online, just open your heart to the Lord right now. and Just, just, just ask Him. You can do it silently. You can just do it out loud. Lord, reveal in me. Show me. Teach me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Reveal to me any and all areas of pride that are affecting my life, that are affecting the way I think, that are affecting my judgment. My desire is to honor you, not to put me first, but to put you first. Thank you, Lord, for helping me, that I can walk in your ways, that I can walk on the path you've chosen that you've set before me. And it's a good path that leads to a good life. And thank you, Lord, that I am blessed to be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give him praise for that now. Just praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I don't ever want to assume that everyone here is a Christian. I don't know. You may or may not be. But I at least want to give you the opportunity, invitation to become a Christian today. What does that mean? It means, according to the Word, Romans chapter 10 says that we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and you can be born again. You're saved, right? So we want to give you that opportunity. Or if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or if you'd like prayer in any area of your life, maybe you're going through something or somebody you know is going through something, come up here to this altar. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you. These men and women are up here to pray with you. Remember that you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, blessed going in and blessed going out, and everything you set your hand to, you're the lender, not the borrower. You're good looking. You're dismissed. God bless you.